shall I say you are? Tell thou the earl that the Lord Bardolph doth attend him here. His lordship is walked forth into the orchard. It pleases your honour not for edification, he himself will answer. What news, Lord Bardolf? Every minute now should be the father of some stratagem. The times are wild. Contention like a horse full of high feeding madly hath broke loose and bears down all before him. Noble Earl, I bring thee certain news from Shrewsbury. Good and God will. As good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death. And in the fortunes of my lord, your son, Prince Harry, slain outright. Both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas, young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field. And Harry Monmouth's brawn, the hulk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. How is this derived? Saw you the field, came here from Shrewsbury. My lord, I spoke with one that came from thence, a gentleman well-bred and of good name that freely rendered me these news for true. Here comes my servant, Travers, whom I sent on Tuesday last to listen after news. My lord, I overrode him on the way, and he is furnished with no certainties more than he happily may retail from me. Now, Travers, what good tidings comes from you? My lord... Sir John and Travel turned me back with joyful tidings, and being better horsed, out rode me. After him came spurring hard a gentleman almost forspent with speed, who stopped by me to breathe his bloodied horse. He asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. He told me that rebellion had ill luck, and that young Harry Percy's spur was cold. Huh? Again? Said he young Harry Percy's spur was cold? Of hot spur, cold spur, that rebellion had met ill luck. My lord, I'll tell you what. If my young lord, your son, have not the day upon mine honor, for a silken point I'll give my barony. Never talk of it. Why should that gentleman that rode by Travers give then such instances of loss? He was some hilding fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on, and upon my life spoke at a venture. Look, he, here comes more. News. Yeah, this man's brow, like to a title they foretells the nature of a tragic volume. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where hateful death put on his ugliest mask to fright our party. How doth my son he... and brother? Thou tremblest, and the whiteness in thy cheek is up to them thy tongue to tell thy errand. This thou wouldst say. Your son did thus and thus, your brother thus. So fought the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds. But in the end, to stop mine ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away this praise. Ending with brother, son, and all are dead. Douglas is living, and your brother, yet. But for my lord, your son... I cannot think my lord, your son, is dead. I am sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed, to Harry Monmouth, whose swift wrath beat down the never-daunted Percy to the earth. Then did our soldiers, aiming at their safety, fly from the field. And was that noble Worcester, too soon tamed prisoner, and that furious Scott, the bloody Douglas, whose well-laboring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king, can veil his stomach and engrace the shame of those that turned their backs, and in his flight, stumbling in fear, was took. The sum of all is that the king hath won, and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. This is the news at full. For this I shall have time enough to mourn. In poison there is physic, and these news, having been well, that would have made me sick, being sick, have in some measure made me well. Hence, therefore, thou nice crutch. A scaly gauntlet now with joints of steel must love this hand. And hence, thou sickly coif. Thou art a guard too wanton for the head which princes fleshed with conquest aim to hit. Now bind my brows with iron. 
and approach the rugged star that time and spite dare bring to frown upon the enraged Northumberland. Train of passion doth you wrong, my lord. Sweet earl, divorce not wisdom from your honour. The lives of all your loving complices lean on your health. The which of you give o'er to stormy passion must perforce decay. We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas that if we wrought our life, twas ten to one. And yet we ventured for the game proposed, choked the respect of likely peril feared, and since we are all set, venture again. Come, we will all put forth body and goods. It is more than time. And my most noble lord, I hear for certain and do speak the truth. The gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man who with a double surety binds his followers. My lord, your son had only but the corpse but shadows and the shows of men to fight. For that same word, rebellion, did divide the action of their bodies from their souls. And they did fight with queasiness, constrained, as men drink potions, that their weapons only seemed on our side, but for their spirits and souls. This word, rebellion, had froze them up as fish are in a pond. But now the bishop turns insurrection to religion. Supposed sincere and holy in his thoughts, he's followed both with body and with mind, and doth enlarge his rising with the blood of fair King Richard, scraped from pomfret stones, derives from heaven his quarrel and his cause, tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land, gasping for life under great Bolingbroke, and more and less do flock to follow him, Go in with me and counsel every man the aptest way to safety and revenge. Get posts and letters and make friends with speed. Never so few and never yet more need. the doctor to me water? He said, sir, the water itself was a good healthy water, but for the party that owed it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. <laughs> Men of all sorts take a pride to go at me. The brain of this foolish compound clay man cannot invent anything that tends more to laughter than I invent or is invented on me. <laughs> I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. <laughs> I do here walk before thee like a sow that hath overwhelmed all a litter but one. <laughs> if the prince put thee in my company for any other reason but to set me off, then I am much mistaken, thou horse and mandrake. <laughs> thou art fitted to wear in me cap than to wait at me heels. <laughs> I was never manned by an agate till now, but I will set thee neither in gold nor silver, but in vile apparel, and send thee back to thy master for a jewel. <laughs> what said... Uh, Master Dumbledore, about the satin for me short cloak and slops. He said, sir, you should procure him better shorts and bardolf. He would not take his bond in yours. He'd like not the security. All right, him be. Damn, like the glutton, may his tongue be hotter. A horse on a hit of hell. A rascal, yea, for sooth, knave, to bear a gentleman in hand and then to stand upon security. Hey. I had rather they, they put rat spain in my mouth than to offer to stop it with security. Where's Bardolph? He's gone into Smithville to buy a worshipful horse. <laughs> I bought him at Paul's, and he'll buy me a horse at Smithfield. <laughs> if I could find me a wife in the stews, I were man, horse, and wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got this, my wife. Sure, here comes an that Stay close, I will not see him. What's he that goes there? Falstaff, and please your lordship. He that is in question about the robbery. Hey, my lord. But he has since done good service at Shrewsbury, and Zaire is now going with some charge to the Lord John of Lancaster. What, to York? Call him back again. Uh, Sir John Falstaff. Boy, tell him I'm deaf. Hmm. You must speak louder. My master is dead. I'm sure he is to the hearing of anything good. Go pluck him by the elbow. I must speak with him. Uh, Sir John. What? A young knave and big? 
Is it not wars? Is it not employments? Doth not the king lack subjects? Do not the rebels need soldiers? Sir, my lord would speak with you. Sir John falls down a word with you. My noble lord God! Give your lordship good time of day. Well, Sir John. I am glad to see your lordship. I heard say your lordship was sick. I trust that your lordship goes abroad upon advice. <laughs> your lordship, although not uh, clean past your youth, hath yet some savour of age in you, Sir some John. relish of the saltiness of time. And Sir John. I humbly beseech your lordship to have a reverent care of your health. Sir John, I sent for you before your expedition to Shrewsbury. May you leave, your lordship. I understand that his majesty has I returned not to his with majesty. some I would not cut... from Wales. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. This is, I believe, the news, moreover, that his highness has fallen into this same horse and apoplexy. Well, God mend him. This I... apoplexy, as I take it, is a kind of lethargy, a, 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 a thickening of the blood, well, a horse and of it, 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 it hath its original much grief. In study and in perturbation of the brain, I have read the causes of his effects in Galen. No, it is a kind of one of the deafness. Mm. Well, I think you have fallen into the disease, for you hear not what I say to you. Oh, very well, my lord, very well. <laughs> say rather, my lord, by your leave, it is the disease of not listening, the malady of not marking, that I am troubled with all. <clears throat> well. The truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. Well, he that buckles him in my belt cannot live in less. Your means is very slender, your waist great. I would it were otherwise. I would my means were greater and my waist slender. You have misled the youthful prince. The young prince has misled me. I am the fellow with the big belly and he my dog. Well, I am loath to gall a new healed wound. Your day's service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your night's uh, exploit on Gad's Hill. Ah, uh, my lord, you that are old consider not the capacities of us that are young. <laughs> you measure the heat of our livers by the bitterness of your galls, and we that are in the vaward of our youth are... I must confess, so <laughs> wags too. <laughs> Do you set down your name in the scroll of youth that are written down old with all the characters of age? Have you not a moist eye, a dry hand, a yellow cheek, a white beard, a decreasing leg, an increasing belly? Is not your voice broken, your wind short, your chin double, your wit single, and every part about you blasted with antiquity, and will you call yourself young? Well, oh, five, 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 Sir John. <sighs> My lord, I was born about three o'clock in the afternoon with a white head and something of a round belly. For my voice, I have lost that with hallelujahing and singing of anthems. To pursue my youth still further, I will not. But to speak the truth, I am old only in wisdom and experience. And he that will caper with me for a thousand pounds, <laughs> let him lend me the money and have at him. For the box of the ear that the young prince gave you, he gave it like a rude prince, and you took it like a sensible lord. I've checked him for it. And the young lion repents, marry not in uh, ashes and sackcloth, but in new silk and old sack. <laughs> God send the prince a better companion. God send the companion a better prince. I cannot rid my hands of him. Well, the king hath severed you and Prince Harry. I hear you going with the Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Yes, I thank your pretty sweet wit for it. And do thou pray, all you that kiss me, lady, peace at home, that our armies engage not in a hot day. For by the Lord I take but two shirts out with me, and I mean not to sweat extraordinarily. If it be a hot day, if I brandish anything but me flagon, me bottle, nay, <laughs> may I never spit white again. There's not a dangerous action doth peep out his head. But I am thrust upon it. Oh, all right. I cannot last ever. And it was always yet the trick of our English nation when they have a good thing to make it too common. If you must need say that I am an old man, then you should give me rest. I would to God my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is. For I had rather be eaten to death with the rust than scoured to nothing with perpetual moose well, be honest, be honest. And God bless your expedition. And my lord, uh, hmm? will your lordship uh, lend me a thousand pounds to furnish me forth? 
Not a penny. Uh, Not a penny. So very well. Oh, commend me to my cousin Westmoreland. If I do, fillet me with a three-man beetle. <sighs> a man can no more separate age and covetousness than he can part young limbs and lechery. <laughs> For the gout galls the one and the pox pinches the other, and both, both the measures deserve my pardon. <laughs> Boy! Sir? What money's in my purse? Seven groats and two pence. I can find no remedy against this consumption of the purse. Borrowing but lingers and lingers it out, and the disease is incurable. Here, yeah. yeah. take these then. This to my lord of Westmoreland, this to the prince, this to Lord John of Lancaster, and this to old Mistress Ursula, whom I have weakly sworn to wed since I perceive the first white hairs on my chin. Oh. About it, you know where to find me. Oh. 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 A pox on this gout, <clears throat> or a gout on this pox, for well, one or the other plays the rogue with me great toe. <laughs> well, it is no matter. If I do halt, I have the wars for me color, and me pension shall seem the more reasonable. <laughs> a good wit will make use of anything. I will turn diseases to commodity. Have you heard our causes, known our means. And my most noble friends, I pray you all speak plainly your opinions of our hopes. And first, Lord Mowbray, what say you to it? I will allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how in our means we should advance ourselves to look with forehead bold and big enough upon the power and puissance of the king. Our present muster grows upon the file to five and twenty thousand men of choice. And our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland, whose bosom burns with an insensate fire of injury. The question then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus. Whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland. With him we may. I marry, there's the point. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far till we had his assistance by the hand. For in a theme so bloody-faced as this, conjecture, expectation, and surmise of age and certain should not be admitted. It is very true, Lord Bardolph. For indeed, it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury. It was, my lord, who lined himself with hope, hating the air on promise of supply, flattering himself with project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts. And so, with great imagination, led his powers to death, and winking, leaped into destruction. But... <laughs> By your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihood and forms of hope. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot, then draw the model. And when we see the figure of the house, then must we rate the cost of the erection, which if we find out ways ability, what do we then but draw anew the model in fewer offices? Or at least, desist to build at all. Much more in this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down, should we survey the plot of situation and the model, Consent upon a sure foundation. I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What is the king but five and twenty thousand? To us, no more. Nay, not so much, Lord Bardolph. For his three divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads. One power against the French, and one against Glendower. Perforce, a third must take up us. So is the unfirm king in three divided, and his coffers sound with hollow poverty and emptiness. 
Who is it like should lead his forces ever? The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland. Against the Welsh himself and Harry Monmouth, but who will substitute against the French? I have no certain notice. Let us on and publish the occasion of our arms. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice. Their overgreedy love hath surfeited. An habitation giddy and unsure hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. Oh, thou fond many, with what loud applause didst thou beat heaven with blessing Bolingbrook before he was what thou wouldst have him be? And being now trimmed in thine own desires, thou beastly feeder art so full of him that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So, so, thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard. And now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up and howls to find it. What trust is in these times? They that when Richard lived would have him die are now become enamoured on his grave. Thou that threw dust upon his goodly head when through proud London he came sighing on after the admired heels of Bolingbroke. Christ now, O earth, yield us that king again and take thou this. Our oh, thoughts of men are cursed. Past and to come seems best. Things present, worst. Shall we go draw our numbers and set on? Now time, subject, and time bids be gone. some of us our lives, he'll stab. Alas, the day take heed of him. He stabbed me in my own house, and that most beastly in good faith. He cares not what mischief he does if his weapon be out. He will foin like any devil. He will spare neither man, woman, nor child. If I can but close with him, I care not for his thrust, eh? No, nor I neither. I'll beat your elbow. If I can but fist him once, if he come but within me vice, eh? I am undone with his going. A hundred mark is a long one for a poor, lone woman to bear. And I have borne and borne and borne and been fubbed off and fubbed off and fubbed off from this day to that day that it is a shame to be thought on. There's no honesty in such dealings. Yonder he comes, and that arrant Malmsey knows bar off with him. Do your offices, do your offices. Master Hanger, Master Snare, do me. Do me, do me. Hello? Who's Mayor eh? What's the matter? Sir John? Uh-huh. I arrest you at the suit of Mistress Quickly. Oh, wait, eh? How dark door cut me off this villain's head, eh? Throw the queen in the cannon! Oh, hey! Hey, split the Sir John, what are you brawling here? That has become your time, your place, your business. You should be well on your way to York. Oh, stand from him, fellow. Wherefore hangs upon him? Oh, my most worshipful lord and please your grace. I am a poor widow of East Chief, and he is arrested at my suit. For what's up? It is more than for some, sir. It is for all I have. 
for you've eaten me out of house and home. He has put all my substance into that belly of his. But I'll have some of it out again, or I'll ride thee a nice like the bear. What is the gross sum that I owe thee? Marry, if thou wert an honest man, thyself and the money too. Thou didst swear to me on a parson gilt goblet, sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a sea coal fire on Wednesday of Whitson week to marry me when the prince had broken thy head for liking his father to a singing man at Windsor. Thou didst promise me as I was washing thy wound to make me my lady thy wife. Canst thou deny it? Did not good wife catch the butcher's wife come in then and call me gossip quickly? Coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar, uh -huh. telling us that she had a good dish of prawns, whereby you did desire to eat some, whereby I told you there was ill for a green wound. And didst thou not, when she was gone downstairs, bid me to be no more familiarity with such poor people, saying that ere long they should call me madam. <laughs> and didst thou not then kiss me and bid me fetch thee thirty shillings? I put thee down to thy book, oh, denied if thou canst. My lord, this is a poor mad soul, and she says up and down the town that her eldest son is like you. <laughs> oh, she hath been in good case, but the truth is poverty hath distracted her. But for these foolish officers, I pray you that I may have redress against them. Sir John, Sir John, I am well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cause the false way. Pay her the money you owe her, and unpay the villainy you have done. The one you may do with sterling money, and the other with uh, <laughs> current repentance. <coughs> Come hither, hostess. How now, Master Gar? The king, my lord, and Henry, Prince of Wales, are near at hand. The rest of the papers. Let me see. As I am a gentleman. Say, if you said so before. As I am a gentleman. Come, no more words of it. By this holy ground I tread on, I must be fain to pawn both me plate and the tapestries of me dining chamber. Glasses, glasses, are you only drinking on for thy walls? Oh, a pretty slight tapestry, or the story of the prodigal, or the German hunting in war to work is worth a thousand of these bed hangings, or these fly-bitten tapestries. <laughs> Let it be ten pounds, if thou canst. Come. If it were not for the humours, there's not a better wench in England. <laughs> Go. Wash thy face. Draw thy suit. <laughs> Come. Thou must not be in this humour with me. <laughs> I know thou must sit on to it. Prith it, Sir John. Let it be but twenty nobles. In faith, I'm loath to pawn me plate, so God save me, La. Let it alone. I'll find other ships. You'll be a fool still. Well, you shall have it. Oh, I have to pawn me gown. I hope you'll come to supper. <laughs> you'll pay me all together. Will I live? <laughs> <laughs> Go with her, with her. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Will you have salt there? She'd have supper with you. No more words. Let's have her. <laughs> you have letters of me presently. Come, go along with me, Master Gar. My, my lord, uh, Master Gar, will I entreat you with me to supper? I must wait upon my good lord here, I think, good Sir John. Sir John, you loiter here too long, being you are to take up soldiers in counties as you go. Uh, Master Gar, will you sup with me? What foolish master taught you these manners, Sir John? Master Gar, if they become me not... He was a fool that taught me them. This is the right fencing grace, my lord. Tap for tap, and so part fair. <laughs> now the lord like me. Quite a great fool. Even way unto my rough affairs. Put not you on the visage of the times and be like them to Percy Troublesome. I have given over. I can speak no more. Do what you will, your wisdom be your guide. Alas, sweet wife, my honor is at pawn, and but my going, nothing can redeem it. Oh, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars. 
The time was, Father, that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now. When your own Percy... When my heart's dear Harry... Through many a northward look to see his father bring up his powers. But he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two others lost, yours and your sons. For yours, the God of heaven brightened it. For his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the grey vault of heaven, and by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was the glass wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. He had no legs that practised not his gait, when speaking thick which nature made his blemish became the accents of the valiant. He was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others, and him, oh wondrous him, oh miracle of men, him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous god of war. Never, oh never do his ghosts the wrong, to hold your honor more precise and nice with others than with him, let them alone. The marshal and the archbishop are strong. And my sweet Harry had but half their numbers. Today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. <laughs> Shrew your heart, fair daughter. You do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. <laughs> but I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. Fly to Scotland, till that the nobles and the armed commons have of their puissance made a little taste. Come, come, go in with me. Tis with my mind as with the tide, swelled unto his height that makes a still stand running neither way. Fain would I go meet the Archbishop, but many thousand reasons hold me back. I will resolve for Scotland. There am I till time and vantage crave my company. I'm exceeding weary. Has it come to that? I'd have thought weariness does not have attached one of so high blood. Faith it does me. Though it discolour the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Doth it not show vilely in me to desire small beer? Well, Prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. Well, then, belike my appetite was not princely got, for by my troth, I do now remember that poor creature, small beer. Ah. And indeed, these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. How well it follows after you've labored so hard, you should talk so idly. Tell me, how many good young princes would do so? Their father's laying so sick as yours is. Shall I tell thee one thing, Poins? Yes, Faith. Let it be an excellent good thing. Mary, then I tell thee. It is not meet that I should be sad now my father is sick. Albeit I could tell to thee. As to one it pleases me for want of a better to call a friend. I could be sad, and sad indeed, too. Very hardly upon such a subject. Now, by this hand, I think me as far in the devil's book as thou and Falstaff, for obduracy and persistency. Let the end try the man. But I tell thee. My heart bleeds inwardly that my father is so sick. 
And keeping such vile company as thou art hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. The reason? What wouldst thou think of me if I should weep? Why, well, I'd think thee a most princely hypocrite. It would be every man's thought. And thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Never a man's thought in the world follows the roadway better than thine. Every man would think me an hypocrite indeed. And what excites your most worshipful thought to think so? Well, because you've been so lewd and so much engraft of false stuff. And to thee. And the matter comes Bardolf. And the boy I gave Falstaff. He had him for me Christian and look at the fat villain have not transformed him ape. Mm. Oh. God save your grace. And yours, most noble bottle. Yeah. Oh, come, you pernicious ass. You bashful fool. Must you be blushing? Wherefore blush you now? Huh? What a maidenly man at arms are you become? Is it such a matter to get a pottle pot's maiden head? He called me even now, my lord, through red lattice, and I could discern no part of his face from the window. Away, you haughty, <laughs> upright rabbit, away! Away, you ruffy! I'll see his dream away. Instruct us by what dream, boy? Marry, my lord. I'll see a dream she was delivered of firebrand. Lefa, I call him her dream. The crown's worth of good interpretation. That's his boy. <laughs> How does your master, by <laughs> Well, my lord, he hath heard of your graces coming to town. And here, here is a letter for you. <laughs> Delivered with good respect. <laughs> And add up the martial mass, your master. In bodily health, sir. <laughs> Marry the immortal part needs the position. <laughs> but that moves not in, though. That is sick, it dies not. I do allow this wen to be as familiar with me as my dog, and he holds his place. But look at how he writes. Sir John Falstaff, knight. To the son of the king, nearest his father. Harry, Prince of Wales, greeting. <laughs> well, this is a certificate. <laughs> Peace. I will imitate the Honourable Romans in brevity. Sure, he means brevity and breath, short-winded. <laughs> I commend me to thee, I commend thee, and I leave thee. Be not too familiar with poems. For he misuses thy favours so much that he swears thou art to marry his sister now. Repent at idle times, as thou mayst, and so farewell. Thine by yea and no, which is as much as to say as thou usest him, Jack Falstaff, with my familiars, John, with my brothers and sisters, and Sir John, uh, 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 with all Europe. <laughs> my lord, I steep this letter in sack and make him eat it. <laughs> to make him eat twenty of his words. But you use me thus, Ned? Must I marry your sister? <laughs> God said the wench no worse fortune, but... I never said so. <laughs> Is your master here that the old boar feeding the old Frank? No, please. <laughs> what company? Ephesians, my lord, of the old church. Sup any women with him? None, my lord, but old Mr. Squitty and Mr. Dolteshi. What pagan may that be? A proper gentlewoman, sir. And a kinswoman, kinswoman of my master. <laughs> Even such kin as the parish heifers are to the town bull. <laughs> Shall we steal upon them, Ned? At supper? I mean, shut my lord, I'll follow you. Sir, you boy and bardo. No word to your master that I'm yet come to town. Uh, There's for your silence. I have no tongue, sir. And for mine, sir? I will govern it. Very you well, go in. <laughs> 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 this doll dash, it should be some road. <laughs> Why don't you? As common as the way between St. Albans and London. <laughs> How might we see Falstaff? Bestow himself tonight in his true colours and not ourselves be seen, huh? Put on two leather jerkins and aprons and wait upon him at his table like drawers. 
from a god to a bull, a heavy declension, that was Jove's case. From a prince to a princess, a low transformation, that shall be mine. For in everything, the purpose must weigh with the folly. Follow me, Nate. John's. Thou knowest, Sir John cannot endure an Apple John. Oh, Master, I say it's true. The Prince once set a dish of Apple Johns before him and told him there were now five more Sir Johns, and putting off his hat, said, I will now take my leave of these six round old withered knights. <laughs> it angered him to the heart, but he forgot that. Why then, cover and set them down, and see if thou canst find out Sneak's noise. Mistress Tearsheet would fain have some music. <laughs> Dispatch! The room where they sucked is too hot. They'll come in straight. Oh, yeah. Sit up, sit up. Here will be the prince and Master Poins anon, and they will put on two of our jerkins and aprons, and Sir John must not know of it. Bardolph hath brought word. <laughs> By the man, it will be old Eutis. It will be an excellent stratagem. I'll see if I can find out, Sneak. <laughs> By my faith, sweetheart, methinks you are now in an excellent good temporality. Your pulsage beats as extraordinary as art would desire, and your colour, I warrant you, is as red as any rose. Ah, in good oh. faith, la. But in faith, you've drunk too much canaries. And that's a marvellous searching wine, and perfumes the blood, eh? You can say, what's this? How do you now? Well, better than I was. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, well, that is well said. <laughs> A good art's worth gold. <laughs> look, look, here comes the John. Great art of first in court. Empty the Jordan, and was a worthy king. And oh, now, Mistress Doll. Sick. Oh. Of a calm, yeah, in good faith. Uh, so is all a sick. If they be once in a calm, they are sick. <laughs> Muddy rogue, is that all the comfort you have to give me? <laughs> oh, but troth, this is for the old fashion. You two never meet, but you fall to some discord. You're both in good truth. As romantic as two dry toasts. You can neither the one bear with another's conformities. <laughs> what the good year. One must bear. And that must be you. You are the weaker vessel, as they say, is the emptier vessel. Can a weak, empty vessel bear such a huge full hogshead? There's a whole merchant's venture of Bordeaux stuff in him. You have not seen a hulk better stuffed in the hold. Come. I'll oh, be friends with thee, Jack. Thou art going to divorce, and whether I shall ever see thee again or no, is nobody cares. Sir, ain't your pistol is below and would speak with you. Oh, hang him, swaggering rogue. Let him not come hither. Tis the foulest mouthed rogue in England. If he swagger, let him not come here. No, by my faith, I must live among my neighbours. I'll no swaggerers. <laughs> I'm in good fame and name with the very best. Shut the door. There comes no swaggerers here. Mm -hmm. I've not lived all this while to have swaggering now. Shut the door, I pray you. No, just no. As if I hear, no, Sir John. Oh. I'll no swaggerers. Dost thou hear, hostess, it is many ancients? Hilly Pally, Sir John, never tell me. Your ancient swaggerer comes not in my doors. I was before Master Tizzik, the deputy, the other day, and as he said to me, it was no longer ago than Wednesday last, if I... <laughs> Neighbour quickly, says he. Uh, Master Dunn, our minister was by then. Neighbour quickly, says he. Receive those that are civil, says he. For, says he, you're in an ill name. Now, he said so. I can tell whereupon. For, says he, you're an honest woman, and well thought of. Therefore, take heed what visitors you receive. Receive, says he, no swaggering companions. There comes none here. Oh, you would bless you to hear what he said. No, 
I'll no swaggerers. He's no swaggerer, hostess. A tame cheater, he, your faith. <laughs> you may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound. Nay, hey, he'll not swagger with a barbary hen. If her feathers turn back in any show of resistance, <laughs> I'll have him up, draw. Cheater call you in. I'll bar no honest man, my daughter, no cheater. But I do not love swaggering, if faith. I am the worst when one says swagger. Feel how I shake. Yes, I warrant you. Oh, so you do, I stay here. Do I? Oh, oh, in good faith, do I? But it were an aspen leaf. I cannot bear swaggering. <laughs> Done with two bullets. Uh -huh. <laughs> she is pistol proof, sir. You shall hardly offend her. Come, I'll drink no proofs and no pistols. I'll drink no more that is good for me, for no man's pleasure, I'm <laughs> Then to you, Mr. Dorothy, I will charge you. Charge yes. me, our scorn, this scurvy companion. You low, base, rascally, cheating, lot linen nature. <laughs> Worth ten of the nine worthies. <laughs> I am 
Uh, a rascal a slave. I will toss the rogue in a blanket. Oh, do if thou dost for thy heart. If thou dost, I'll canvas thee between a pair of shoes. Oh. <laughs> huh? The music is come, sir. Oh, let them play. I'm sit on me needle. Oh, <laughs> oh you talk a little tidy, but none of you poor big you. When wilt thou leave fighting the days and, and foining the nights and begin to patch up thine own old body for heaven? Nay, hey, good doll, do not speak like a death's head. Do not bid me remember men end. Oh, oh, a good fellow, young fellow, yes. He would have made a good pantler. He would have chipped bread well. They say Poins has a good wit. He a good wit? Hang him, baboon. His wits are thick as Tewkesbury mustard. He hath no more conceit in him than a mallet. Would not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off? Let's beat him before his hall. Look whether the withered elder have not his poll clawed like a parrot. Is it not strange that desire should so many years outlive performance? Kiss me, doll. Saturn and Venus this year in conjunction. What says the almanac to that? Right, my trot. I do kiss thee most constantly. Mm, I am old. I am old. I love thee better than I love... Here is curvy young boy of them all. That goes late. Will to bed. <laughs> ah, thou wilt forget me when I'm gone. Oh, my God. Thou wilt set me a weeping if thou sayest so. Oh, 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 oh. Mm -hmm. Francis, some sick. I don't know, sir. <laughs> You how vilely did you speak of me even now before this honest, virtuous, civil gentleman? Ooh, now, God bless the kind heart of yours, and so she is by my troth. Can so hear me? <laughs> yeah. And you knew me, as you did when you ran away by Gad's Hill. Huh? You knew I was at your back, and you spoke it on purpose to try my patience. No, 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 not so. No, I did not know that was within hearing. I shall drive you then to confess the willful abuse, and then I know how to handle you. No abuse, hell, no abuse. What? Not to dispraise me, and call me Panther and Bread Chipper. And... What? No abuse, hell, no abuse. No, none in the world, none, good Ned, none. I did but dispraise him before the wicked, that the wicked might not fall in love with him, oh. in the doing which I have done my part as a careful friend and a true subject, <laughs> and his father is to give me thanks for it. <laughs> but the no abuse has no abuse. No, 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 Who knocks aloud at door? Look at the door there, Francis. 
Ah, Peter, I know what news. The king, your son, is at Westminster, under a twenty weak and weary post come from the north. And as I came along, I met and overtook some dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, asking every one for Sir John Falstaff. Well, I haven't points, I feel me much to blame, so I live to profane the precious time. When tempest of commotion, like the south born with black vapors that begin to melt and drop upon our bare, unarmed heads. Give me my sword and cloak. Now comes in the sweetest morsel of the night, and we must hence and leave it unpicked. Ah, oh, more knocking at the door. Oh, now, what's the matter? Uh, you must, of course, sir, presently. A dozen captains stay at door for you. Sit up, pay the musicians. Farewell, hostess. Oh, Farewell, oh, dog. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, you may see now how men of merit are sought after. The young deservers may sleep, but the man of action is called on. Farewell. Sweet wenches! Sweet Jack, have a care for thyself! Farewell! Farewell! Well, very well. I've known thee these twenty-nine years, come please, God time. But a handsomer, sure-hearted man, I said. <laughs> Mr. Tessie, <laughs> what is the matter? Bid Mr. Tessie uh, come to my master. Oh! Run, doll, run! Run, good doll! Yay, will you come, doll? Many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep. Oh, sleep. Oh, gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse. How have I frighted thee 
that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness. Why, rather, sleep. Liest thou in smoky cribs upon uneasy pallets stretching thee, and hushed with buzzing night flies to thy slumber, than in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with sounds of sweetest melody. O oh, thou dull god, why liest thou with the vile and loathsome beds, and leaves the kingly couch a watch case or a common larum bell? Will thou Upon the high and giddy mast, seal up the ship boy's eyes, and rock his brains in cradle of the rude imperious surge, and in the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamors in the slippery clouds that with the early death itself awakes. Canst thou? Oh. Partial sleep, give thy repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude. And in the calmest and most stillest night, with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king. Then, happy low, lie down, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Many good morrows to your majesty. Is it good morrow, lord? It's two o'clock and past. Why then, good morrow to you all, my lord. Have you read all the letters that I sent you? We have, my liege. My lord Northumberland will soon be cooled. Oh, God, that one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times make mountains level. It is not ten years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, did feast together, and in two years after were they at wars. It is but eight years since, when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, did speak these words, now proved a prophecy. Northumberland, thou ladder! by the which my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne, though then God knows I had no such intent. The time shall come, thus did he follow it. The time will come. The foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption, and so went on foretelling this same time's condition and the division of our amity. They say the bishop of Northumberland, uh, 50,000 strong. Is it your grace to go to bed? On my soul, my lord. The powers you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. And to comfort you the more, I have received a certain instance that Glendower is dead. These unseasoned hours perforce must add unto your sickness. I will take your counsel. To all these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear Lord, turn to the Holy Land.
come on, come on, come on. Give me your hand, sir. Give me your hand, sir. Oh, oh, oh. An early stirrer by the road. Hmm? Oh. And how does my good cousin Zylus? Oh, good morrow, good cousin Shallow. And how does my cousin your bedfellow? Oh. Hmm? And your fairest daughter, mine, my goddaughter, Ellen. Oh, alas, a, a black owl is all, cousin Shallow. Hmm? Right. Yeah, and they said, I dare say my cousin William has become a good scholar. He is at Oxford still, is he not? Indeed, sir. To my cost. I must send to the inns of court shortly. I was once a Clement's inn. Where I think we will talk of mad shallow yet. You were called lusty shallow then, cousin. Well, the master was called anything. And I would have done anything, too. And roundly, too. And there was I. Little John Doyle of Staffordshire, Black Jock Barn, Francis Pitbone, <laughs> Will Squeal, a cot's old man. <laughs> well, you had not four such swinge bucklers in all the inns of court again. And I may say to you, we knew where all the boner rovers were, and had the best of them at commandment. <laughs> but then was Jack Falstaff, well, now Sir John, a boy, and page to Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. Uh, this Sir John, cousin, that comes hither and on about, um, um, uh, um, soldiers. The same Sir John, the very same. I see him break Scoggins' head at the court gate when it was a crack, not thus high. <laughs> and the same day did I fight with one Samson Stockfish, a fruiterer. Behind Gray's Inn. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The days that I have seen. <laughs> to see how many of my old acquaintance are dead. We shall all follow, cousin. Yeah, that's certain. Oh, it's very sure, very sure, very sure. Death, as the psalmist said, is certain to all. All shall die. How oh, a good yoke of bullocks now at Stamford Firm. By my troth, I was not there. Death is certain. Is old double of your town living there? Dead, sir. Treasure is you. Dead. But draw a good bow. I shot a fine shoe. But John of God loved him well, bet as much money on his head. Would have clapped you in the club to twelve scores. How a score of you now? And is all double. Dead. Oh, here comes to us Sir John Falstaff's men, as, as I think. Yes. Good morrow, honest gentlemen. Would I beseech you which is just as shallow? I am Robert Shallow, sir. Uh, uh, what is your good pleasure with me? My captain, sir, commends him to you. My captain, Sir John Falstaff. Oh, how doth the good knight? <laughs> uh, may I ask how my lady, his wife, doth? <laughs> uh, uh, pardon, sir. A soldier is better accommodated than with a wife. Yes, it is very well said, he face. Oh, it is very well said indeed, too. <laughs> Better accommodated. It is good indeed, is it? Yes. Accommodated. It comes of accommodo. It's a very good phrase. <laughs> Pardon, sir. I have heard the word. A phrase, call it. By my life, I know not the phrase. <laughs> and I will maintain the word with my sword to be a soldier-like word. A word of exceeding good command by him. Accommodated, that is, when a man is, um, as they may say, um, accommodated, or when a man is being whereby he may be thought to be accommodated, which is an excellent thing. Yes, it is very just. Mm. Oh, look, here comes good Sir John. Here comes good Sir John. Oh, give me your hand. Give me your worship's good hand. Oh, by my 
that's wrong. You, you, you like very well, and you bear your ears very well. Welcome, good Sir John. Well, I am indeed glad to see the good Master Robert Shello. Uh, uh, Master Shawcards, I think. No, Sir John, it is my cousin Silence in commission with me. Oh, good Master Silence, it well befits thou shouldst be of the peace. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, your, your good worship is welcome. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> it's hot weather, gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, have you procured me here <coughs> half a dozen of sufficient pen? Mary, have we, sir? Now, now, will it please you sit? Yeah. Let me see them, I beseech you. Uh, where's the roll? Uh, where's the roll? Uh, the roll? Where's the roll? Oh, 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 oh. let me see, let me see. Oh, 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 oh. yes, Mary, sir. Oh, yeah. so, so, so. Let them, let them appear, as I call them. Let them do so. Let them, let them do so. Let them do so. Right, Moldy. Where's Moldy? Here, please. Yes. Yeah. What think you, Sir John? He's a, a good-limbed fellow. Yum. Strong and a good friend. Thy name, Moly? Yeah, yeah. Just the more time thou would use. Excellent effect. It's Those things that are moldy lack use. <laughs> oh, it's well said, Richard. Prick him. I was pricked well enough before her, and you could have let me alone. My old dame will be undone now for wanted to do her husbandry and her drudgery. You, you need not to have pricked me. There are other men fitter to go out than I. Go to him, Moly. Thou shalt go. Moly, it is time you were spent. Spent? Peter, Peter, stand aside. No, no, you wait. Ah. Time and shadow. Oh, Mary, let me have him to sit under. <laughs> He's like to be a cold soldier. <laughs> well, Shadow. Yes, sir. Well, Shadow. Whose son art thou? My mother's son, sir. Thy mother's son, like enough. Uh -huh. And thy father's shadow? Do you like him, Sir John? Oh, shadow will serve for summer. Prick him. <laughs> we have a number of shadows to fill up the muster book. <laughs> Thomas, what? Where's he? Here, sir. Thy name what? Yes, sir. That's a very ragged one. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I prick him down, Sir John? T'was superfluous. His apparel is built upon his back. The whole frame stands upon pins. Oh, I pray thee, prick him no more. <laughs> you can do it, sir. You can do it. I commend you well. <laughs> Francis Feeble. Yes, sir. What trade art thou, people? A, a woman's tailor, sir. Shall I prick him, sir? You may, if he be the man's tailor to prick you. <laughs> well, wilt thou make as many holes in an enemy's battle as thou hast done in a woman's petticoat? I will do my good will, sir. You can have no more. Well said, woman's tailor. Well said, courageous feeble. <laughs> thou wilt be as valiant as the wrathful dove or the most magnanimous mouse. <laughs> prick me, the woman's tailor. <laughs> hmm? I, I would that Wart might have gone, sir. I would that thou hadst been a man's tailor, that thou mightst have mended him and made him fit to go. Let that suffice, most possible feeble. It shall suffice. I am bound to the reverend feeble. Who's next? Peter Bulka. Oh, please. Oh, oh, Mary, let us see Bulka. Here, sir. Oh, oh God, he's a likely fellow. Come, prick me. Bullcalf till he roars again. Oh, Lord, uh, good my Lord. Captain. Why dost thou roar before that prick? Oh, Lord, sir, I am a diseased man. Oh, what disease hast thou? A horse and cold, sir. A cough. <coughs> <coughs> Which I caught from ringing in the king's affairs upon his coronation day, sir. Oh, thou shalt to the walls in the gown. We will have away thy cold, and I will take such measure 
that thy friend shall ring for thee. <laughs> <laughs> Is here all? Oh, here, here are two more calls than your number, sir. You must have but four, yes, sir. <laughs> and so I pray you, go in with me to dinner. Well, I will go drink with you, but I cannot tarry dinner. Oh, sit down, sit down. <laughs> I am glad to see thee by me troth, Master <laughs> Shallow. <laughs> oh, Sir John. Do you remember when we lay all night in the windmill in St. George's Field? Oh, no more of that, Master Shallow, no more of that. It was a, it was a merry night. And is Jane Nightwork alive? When she lives, Master Shallow? She never could away with me. Never? Never! She would always say she could not abide, Master Shallow. I could anger her to the heart. She was then a boner ruba. Does she hold her own well? Old, old, Master Shallow. She must be old. She cannot choose but be old. Certainly she's old. And had Robin Nightwork by old Nightwork before I came to Clement's Inn. That's fifty-five years ago. Ah, cousin Silence, that thou had seen what this knight and I have seen. Ah, Sir John, said I not well. Uh, we have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shallow. That we have, that we have, that we have. In faith, Sir John, we have. <laughs> Our watchword was... <laughs> Hem, boys! Oh, oh, come, let's to dinner. Come, let's to dinner. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, the days that I have seen. Oh, come, come, let's to Oh, hem, boys! Oh, my God. Hem, boys! Oh, my God. Good Master Corporate Bardolph. Stand, my friend. And here is four Ari ten shillings for you in French crowns. Go to stand aside. <laughs> <laughs> the lads are caught in town. For my old dame's sake, stand, my friend. She, huh? she has nobody to do anything about her when I am gone. She is old and cannot help herself. <laughs> you, you shall have forty, sir. <laughs> Go to stand aside. <laughs> By my troth, I care not. A man may die but once. We owe God a death. I will never bear a base mind. If it be my destiny, so. If it be not, so. No man is too good to serve his prince. And let it go which way it will. He that dies this year is quits for the next. Well, say the next little fellow. I will never bear a base mind. Oh, what men shall I have? Part of which you please. Sir John, a word with you. I have uh, three pounds to free Mouldy and Bullcar. I do. Well? Come, Sir John, which four will you have? Oh, well, do thou choose for me. Marry then. Um, Mouldy, Bullcar, uh, Beeble, and Shadow. Bullcar, and. Uh, hmm. Well, well, for thy part, Mouldy. Stay at home till you are past service. And for you, Bullcalf, grow until you come unto it. I will none of you. Oh, but, oh, Sir John, Sir John, now do not yourself wrong. These are your likeliest men, and I would have you served with the best. Will you tell me, Master Shallow, how to choose a man? Care I for the limbs, the thews, the stature, the bulk and big semblance of a man? Not so. Give me the spirit, Master Shallow. Here's what. Now, you see what a ragged appearance it is, but he will charge you and discharge you with the motion of a pewterous hammer. Burnoff, put me a caliber into Watt's hand. Uh, Watt! Travers! Uh, thus! 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 <laughs> he is not his craft's master. He, he doesn't do it right. <laughs> I remember at my end green when I lay at Clement's Inn. I was then Sir Dagon at Arthur's show. <laughs> now, there was a little quiver fella, and he would manage his piece thus. Now, he would have out, and he would have out, and he would have come you in, and he would have come you in, and tap, 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 with a say, and a bounce with a say, and away again with a go, and away again with a come, and a bounce with a say. I shall never see such a fellow. Well, these 
fellows will do well enough, Master Sheriff. <laughs> I'll fare you well, gentlemen, both. Good, Master Shylam, sir. Hey, I will not use many words with you. I thank you. I must a thousand miles tonight. <laughs> it seems better for twelve. I... Ah, pardon. March the men away. <laughs> God preserve you, Sir John. The Lord bless you. God send us peace. <laughs> Fare you well, gentle gentlemen. Mm. Mm -hmm. As I return, I will fetch off these justices. <gasps> Lord, Lord. <laughs> I begin to see the bottom of justice shallow. Oh, Lord. How subject we old men are to this vice of lying. <laughs> This same starved justice hath done nothing but prate to me of the wildness of his youth, and of the deeds he hath done about Turnbull Street, and every third word a lie. I do remember him at Clement's Inn, like a man made after supper of a cheese pairing. <laughs> when he was naked, he was for all the world like a forked radish, with a head fantastically carved atop it with a knife. <laughs> And yet the very genius of famine. And yet lecherous as a monkey. The horse called him Mandrake. <laughs> and now is this vice's dagger become a squire. And talks as familiarly of John of Gaunt as though he'd been sworn brother to him. I'll be sworn he never met him but once in the tilt yard. Then he burst his head for crowding in among the marshal's men. I saw it. I told John of Gaunt that he beat his own name. You might have crammed him and all his apparel into an eelskin. <laughs> the case of a, of a treble hoboy were a mansion for him, a court. <laughs> and now hath he land and beefs. <sighs> I will become acquainted with him if I do return. It shall go hard. But I will make him the philosopher's two stones to me. If the young dace be a bait for the old pike, I see no reason in the law of nature. But I may snap at him. Or oh, time shape. <laughs> and there, an end. <sighs> Planted here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, my gentle Lord Archbishop, and so to you, Lord Hastings, and to all. My Lord of York, it better showed with you when that your flock, assembled by the bell, encircled you to hear with reverence your exposition on the holy text, than now to see you here, an iron man, talking, cheering her out of rebels with your drum, turning the word to sword and life to death. Good, my Lord of Lancaster. I am not here against your father's peace. The time, disordered, doth in common sense cloud us and crush us to this monstrous form, whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed asleep with grant of our most just and right desires. If not, we ready are to try our fortunes to the last man. And though we here fall down, we have supplies to second our attempt. If they miscarry, theirs shall second them. You are too shallow, Hastings, much too shallow to sound the bottom of the aftertimes. Pleaseth your grace to answer them directly, how far forth you do like their articles. I like them all, and do allow them well, and swear here, by the honour of my blood, my father's purposes have been mistook. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed. Upon my soul, they shall. If this may please you, discharge your power unto their several counties, as we will ours. And here, between the armies, let's drink together, friendly and embrace, that all their eyes may bear those tokens home of our restored love and amity. I take your princely word for these redresses. I give it you, and will maintain my word. And hereupon I drink unto your grace.
Go, Captain, and deliver to the army this news of peace. Let them have pay and part. I know it will well please them highly, Captain. To you, my noble Lord of Westmoreland. I pledge your grace. And if you knew what pains I have bestowed to breed this present peace, you would drink freely. But my love to ye shall show itself more openly hereafter. I do not doubt you. I am glad of it. Help to my lord and gentle cousin, Mowbray. You wish me health in very happy season, for I am on the sudden something ill. Believe me, I am passing light in spirit. Well, the peace is rendered. Hark how they shout. This had been cheerful after victory. Now, peace is of the nature of a conquest. For then both parties nobly are subdued, and neither party loser. Go, my lord, and let our army be discharged, too. I trust, lords, we shall lie tonight together. Now, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? The leaders, having charged from you to stand, will not go off until they hear you speak. They know their duties. My lord, our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unyoked they took their course, east, west, north, south. Or like a school broke up, each hurries towards his home and sporting place. Good tidings, my lord Hastings, for the which I do arrest thee, traitor of high treason. And you, Lord Archbishop, and you, Lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I arrest you both. Is this proceeding just and honourable? Is your assembly so? Do you thus break your faith? I pawn thee none. I promised you redress of those same grievances whereof you did complain, which by mine honour I will perform with the most Christian care. But for you, rebels, look to taste the due meat for rebellion and such acts as yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here and foolishly sentence. Some guard these traitors to the block of death. Treason's true bed and yield her up of breath. Now, Falstaff, where have you been all this while? When everything is ended, then you come. I should be sorry, my lord, but it should be thus. I never knew yet, but rebuke and check was the reward of valor. Do you think me a swallow, an arrow, or a bullet? Have I, in my old and poor motion, the expedition of thought? I have hurried hither, within the very extremest inch of possibility. Therefore, I pray you, do me right. And let desert mount. Retreat is made and execution stays. And then dispatch me toward the court. My lord, I hear the king, my father, is sore sick. Our news shall go before us to his majesty, which cousin you shall bear to comfort him. And we, with sober speed, will follow you. Uh, my lord, I, I do beseech you that I may return through Gloucestershire. And when you get to court... Stand, my good lord, I pray you, in your good report. Fare you well, Falstaff. I, in my condition, shall better speak of you than you deserve. Well, would you have but the wit to a better than your dukedom? Good faith. This same young sober-blooded boy doth not love me. Nah. Not a man can it make him laugh at the... That's no marvel, he drinks no wine. Eh, there's never any of these demure boys come to any proof. Uh, thin drinking doth so overcool their blood and making many fish meals that they fall into a kind of male green sickness. <laughs> and then when they marry, they get wenches. Eh, eh they're generally cowards. <laughs> cowards and fools, which some of us should be too, if, uh, if it were not for... Inflammation. <laughs> a good sheriff's sack hath a twofold operation in it. It ascends me to the brain, dries me there, all the foolish and dull and crudy vapors that environ it, makes it apprehensive, quick, fugitive, filled with nimble, 
fiery and delectable shapes, which being transmitted to the mouth, the tongue, which is the birth, become excellent wit. <laughs> A second property of your excellent sheriffs is the warming of the blood, which before cold and settled made the liver white and pale, which is the badge of pusillanimity and cowardice. But the sheriffs warms it and makes it coarse through the innards to the parts extreme. It illumineth the face, which, as a beacon, doth send out warning to all the rest of this little kingdom, man to arm, and then all the vital commoners and inland petty spirits do muster with them all to their captain, the heart, who great and puffed up with this retinue doth any deed of courage. From this valor comes of sheriffs. <laughs> so that skill in the weapon is nothing without sack for that Sets it to work, and learning but a hoard of gold kept by a devil until sack commences it and sets it in act and use. Here of is it that Prince Harry is valiant. For the cold blood that he did naturally inherit from his father, he hath, like lean, sterile, and bare land, manured, husbanded, tilled, with excellent endeavor of drinking good and good store of fertile sherris that he has become very hot and valiant. <laughs> if I had a thousand sons, the first humane principle I would teach them would be to forswear thin quotations and to addict themselves to sack. Our Lord, if God doth give successful end to this debate that bleedeth at our doors, we will. Our youth lead on to higher fields and draw no swords but what are sanctified. Only we want a little personal strength to pause us till these rebels now afoot come underneath the yoke of government. Both which we doubt not, but your majesty shall soon enjoy Humphrey, my son of Gloucester, where is the prince, your brother? I think he's gone to hunt, my lord, at Windsor. And how accompanied? I do not know, my lord. Is not his brother Thomas of Clarence with him? No, my good lord. He is in presence here. What would my lord and father? Nothing but well to thee, Thomas of Clarence. A chance thou art not with the prince, your brother. Why art thou not at Windsor with him, Thomas? He is not there today. He dines in London. And how accompanied? Canst thou tell that? With poins and other his continual followers. <sighs> Who's here? Westmoreland. Health to my sovereign, and new happiness added to that that I am to deliver. Prince John, your son, doth kiss your grace's hand. Mowbray, the bishop's group, Hastings, and all are brought to the correction of your law. There is not no a rebel sword on sheet, but peace puts forth her olive everywhere. Oh, Westmoreland, thou art a summer bird that ever in the haunch of winter sings the lifting up of day. Oh, look, here's more news. The Earl of Northumberland and the Lord Bardolph, with a great power of English and of Scots, are by the Shreve of Yorkshire overthrown. <sighs> And oh, whoever should these good news make me sick? Will fortune never come with both hands, fool? I should rejoice now at this happy news. 
Now I must. Sight fails. My brain grows giddy on me. Come here, my lord. I must sink to my lord. Look here, look here. 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 made, my gentle friends, unless some dull and favorable hand will whisper music to my weary spirit. Call for the music in the other room. Set me. Set me the crown upon my pillow here. His eye is hollow, and he changes much. Foul oh, now, rain within doors and none abroad. Out of the king. Exceeding ill. Hiding the good news yet. Tell it. Let us withdraw into the other room. Please, it's your grace to go along with us. Now. I will sit and watch here by the king. Why doth the crown lie there upon the pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow? O oh, polished perturbation, golden care, that keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now. Yet not so sound or half so deeply sweet as he whose brow, with homely big and bound, snores out the watch of night. Oh, majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day that scalds with safety. By his gates of breath there lies a downy feather, which stirs not. Did he suspire that light and wakeless down, perforce must move? My gracious lord! My father! This sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep. From this golden wrinkle have divorced so many English kings. Thy due from me his tears and heavy sorrows of the blood, which nature, love, and filial tenderness shall. Oh, dear father. Pay thee plenteously my due from thee. Is this 
imperial crown, which, as immediate from thy place and blood, derives itself to me. which God shall guard and put the world's whole strength into one giant arm. It shall not force this lineal honor from me. It is from thee that I to mine leave as it is left to me. How fares your grace? I did you leave me here alone, my lord. We left the prince, my brother, here, my liege. The prince of Wales. Where is he? Let me see him. He is not here. This door is open. He's gone this way. He came up through the chamber where we stayed. Where? Is the crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. A bread shut day the dance. Go seek him out, tis he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep, my death. Find him, my lord of Warwick. Sight him, Edda. This part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me. See, sons, what things you are. How quickly nature falls into a revolt when gold becomes our object. Now, where is he that will not stay so long till his friend sickness hath determined me? My lord, I found the prince in the next room. Washing with kindly tears his gentle cheeks. But, wherefore, did he take away the crown? Lo, there he comes. Come with him out to me, Harry. Depart the chamber, leave us here alone. I never thought to hear you speak again. I wish was Father Harry to that thought. I stay too long by thee. I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for my empty chair that thou wilt needs invest thee with mine honors before thy hour be ripe? Oh, foolish youth, thou seekst the honor that will overwhelm thee. What? Couldst thou not forbear me half an hour? Then get thee gone and dig my grave thyself. And bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Let all the tears that should bedew my hearse we drops of balm to sanctify thy head. Only compound me with forgotten dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the earth. Pluck 
Don't my officers break my decrees, for now a time has come to mock at form. Harry, the fifth, is crowned up vanity. Down, royal state. All you sage counselors, hands. And do the English court assemble now from every region, apes of idleness? Now, neighbor confines, purge you of your scum, of your ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel the night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sins, the newest kind of ways. Be happy, he will trouble you no more. England will rub double guild his treble guilt. England will give him office, honor, might. Oh, my poor kingdom, sick with civil blows, when that my care could not withhold thy riot, what wilt thou do when riot is thy care? Oh, thou wilt be a wilderness again. Peopled with wolves, thy old inhabitants. Where is your crown? And he that wears the crown immortally, long guard it yours. If I affect it more than as your honor and as your renown, let me no more from this obedience rise. God witness with me. When I here came in and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. Coming to look on you, thinking you dead, and dead almost, my liege, to think you were, I spake unto this crown as having sense. Accusing it, I put it on my head to try with it as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father. But if it did infect my blood with joy or swell my heart to any strain of pride, let God forever keep it from my head, and make me as the poorest vassal is that doth with awe and terror leave all to it. Now come hither to me, Harry. Sit down by my bed, and here I think the very latest counsel. Ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son, by what bipartisan, indirect, crooked ways I met this crown. And I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee it shall descend with better quiet, better opinion, better confirmation for all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth. And now my death changes the mood. For what in me was purchased falls upon me in a more fairer sort. Yet, though thou standst more sure than ever than I could do, Thou stands not firm enough since griefs are green. Therefore, my Harry, keep thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels that action hence born out.
may wish the memory of the former days. How I can buy the crown. Oh, God forgiven. And grant it may with thee in true peace live. My gracious Lord, you won it, wore it, kept it, gave it me. Then plain and right must my possession be, which I with more than with a common pain against all the world will rightfully maintain. Look, here comes my John of Lancaster. Health, peace, and happiness to my royal father. Thou bringst me happiness and peace, son John. But health, I lack, with your four wings, is flown from this bear with a trunk. Upon thy sight, my worldly. Business makes a period. Uh, 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 where is my Lord of Warwick? My Lord of Warwick. Jerusalem, my noble lord. Oh, lord be to God. Even now my life shall end. It, it had been prophesied to me many years. I should not die, but in Jerusalem, which vainly I suppose the holy land. But bear me to that chamber. There I lie. In that How doth the king? Exceeding well. His cares are now all ended. I would his majesty had called me with him. Indeed, I think the young king loves you not. I know he doth not. And do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time. Here comes the heavy issue of debt, Harry. Oh, God, I fear all will be overturned. Good morrow. Good morrow. We meet like men that had forgot to speak. Well, peace be with him that hath made us heavy. Peace be with us, lest we be heavier. Oh, my good Lord, you have lost a friend indeed. Though no man be assured what grace to find, 
You stand in coldest expectation. I am the sorrier. Would twere otherwise. Well, you must now speak Sir John Falstaff fair. Sweet princes, what I did, I did in honor. Led by the impartial conduct of my soul. If truth and upright innocency fail me, I to the king my master that is dead and tell him who hath, who hath sent me after him. Here comes the prince. Good morrow, and God save your majesty. This new and gorgeous garment. Majesty. It's not so easy on me as you think. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. This is the English, not the Turkish court. Not Amurath, and Amurath succeeds. But Harry. Harry. We hope no other from your majesty. You all look strangely on me. And you most. You are, I think, assured I love you not. I am assured if I be measured rightly, your majesty hath no just cause to hate me. No? How might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What? Rate, rebuke, and roughly send to prison the immediate heir of England? Was this easy? May this be washed in Lethe and forgotten? There is my hand. You shall be as the father to my youth. My voice shall sound as you do prompt my tongue. And I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practiced wise directions. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now doth it turn and ebb back to the sea, where it shall mingle with the state of floods, and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Our coronation done, we will excite, as I before remembered, all our state. And God, consigning to my good intents, no prince, no peer, shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. Eh? You shall see my orchard, where in an arbor we will eat a last year's pippin of mine own grapping with a dish of caraway and so forth. Oh, come, cut in silence, and then to bed. Oh, God, you have a goodly dwelling here, and a rich baron. Baron, baron. Beggars all? Uh, uh, Beggars all, Sir John? You marry, good heir. <sighs> Oh, uh, spread, David, spread, David, oh, spread, David, sir, spread, David. Spread, David. Oh, 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 well said, David, well said. Yes, yeah, this David serves you to some uses. He's your serving man and your husband. Oh, 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 oh. He's a good valet, he's a good valet, he's a good valet, Sir John. I have a mess, I've drunk too much sack at the sun. Come, sit, sit, sit. Come, cousin. Oh, Sir Aquata, we shall do nothing but eat and make good cheer. Do nothing but eat and make good cheer. Do nothing but fall out and eat and make good cheer.
Master of Silence. I, I'll give you a help for this, Anon. <laughs> give Master Bagon some wine. Oh, please. sweet sir, sit. I'll be with you, Anon. Sweet sir, sit. <laughs> master Page, good Master Page, sit. <laughs> oh, oh, pro face. <laughs> what you want in meat, we'll have in drink. <laughs> but you bear the heart soul. <laughs> be merry, Master Bagon. And my little pink soldier there. Be merry, be merry, be merry, be merry. My wife has all, for women I shrew, both short and tall. Tis merry in hall, when beers wag all. And welcome, merry shrove tide. Be merry, be uh, merry. I did not think that Master Silence had been a man of this metal. Oh, I, sir, I have been merry twice and once, sir, now. <laughs> there is a dish of leather coats for you. Uh, Your worship will be with you, sir. <laughs> uh, a cup of wine, sir. Oh, a cup of wine. Let's brisk and fight and drink unto the demon mind. And the merry heart lives long. <laughs> Well said, Master Silence. <laughs> we shall be merry. Now comes in the, the sweet of the night. Uh, here's a health to you, Master Silence. And long life to you. <laughs> fill the cup and let it come. I'll pledge you a mile to the bottom. Honest, <laughs> Bardot. Welcome. If thou wantst anything and wilt not call, be shrew thy heart. And welcome indeed to my little tiny deep. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Welcome indeed to. I'll drink to Master Bardo and to all the Calvaleros around London. I hope to see London once ere I die. If I might see thee there, Davy. Mass you crack a quart together with the knock, eh? Yes, that sir, that in that. a puddle pot. Sit door there, who knock? Well, now you've done me right. <laughs> Me right and dump me night over oh, oh, Samingo. Oh, uh, it's not so. It is so. It's so? Oh, I then say an old man can do somewhat. Please, Your Worship, with one pistol come from the court with news. From the court? Well, oh, let's have him in. <laughs> hey, 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 God save you, Sir John. Uh, what wind blew you here? Not the ill wind, which blows not to good. Sweet knight, thou art now one of the greatest men in the realm. My lady, I think he be. But good man, puff of bars. Puff, puff in thy teeth, most recreant coward base. Ah, Sir John, I am thy pistol and thy friend. Kelter, Kelter, have I wrote to thee. And tidings do I bring, and lucky joys, and golden times, and happy news of price. I prithee now, expound them to us like a man of this world. Ah, who trap of this world and worldling face? I speak of Africa and golden joys. Oh, base Assyrian knight, what is thy news? Let King Cophetua know the truth thereof. Give me your pardon, sir. Now, if, sir, you come from the court, I take it there is but two ways. Either to utter them... Or to conceal them. <laughs> I am, sir, under the king in some authority. Under which king, Bessonian? Speak or die. Under King Harry. Harry the Fourth or Fifth? Harry the Fourth. <laughs> For thine office, Sir John, thy tender lambkin now is king. Harry the Fifth's the man I speak the truth. When Bissell lies, do this and fig me like a bragging Spaniard. What? Is the old king dead? As nailing door, the things I speak are just. Away, Pardot! Settle my horse! Master Shallow! Good Master Shallow! Be what thou wilt in this kingdom! Choose what office thou likest! It is thine! What good news I do bring! I'll carry Master Silence to bed! Oh, good Master Shallow! Lord Justice Shallow! Be what thou wilt! I am Fortune Steward! <laughs> Get on thy boots! We'll ride all night! Oh, sweet pistol! Away, Pardot! Pistol, do utter more to me, and with all device something to do thyself good. Boot, boot, Master Shallow. I know the young king is sick for me. Let us take any man's horses. For the laws of England 
not at my commandment. Blessed are they that have been my friends. And woe unto my Lord Chief Justice. him as he goes by and do that, but not the countenance he will give me. God bless your lungs. Good night. Down here, pistol. Stand behind me. Oh, if I had had time to have made new liveries, I would have bespent some of that thousand pounds that I did borrow of thee. Oh, but tis no matter. This poor array doth better. This doth in further zeal. I have to see him. He got so. Uh, it shows the earnestness of my affection. He got so. My devotion. He got it. Got it. Got it. As it were to ride day and night, and not to deliberate, not to remember, not to have patience to shift me. It is most certain. But to stand, stained with travel, sweating with desire to see him, thinking of nothing else, putting all other affairs into oblivion, as if there were nothing else to be done but to see him. Speak to that vain man. How do your wits know what it is you speak? By Jove, I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a pool and jester. I have long dreamt of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old and so profane. But being awaked, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body hence and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. No, the grave doth gape for thee. Thrice wider than for other men. Reply not to me with a fool-born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive, that I have turned away my former self. So will I those that kept me company. When thou dost hear, I am as I have been. Approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast the tutor and the feeder of my rights. Till then, I banish thee on pain of death, not to come near our person by ten miles. For competence of life, I will allow thee that lack of means enforce you not to evils. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will, according to your strengths and qualities, give you advancement. Be it your charge, my lord, to see performed the tenor of our word. Set on! <laughs> Thousand pounds. I marry, sir. 
Which I beseech you to let me have home with me. Nay, uh, that can hardly be. Uh, do, not, do not you grieve, Master Shallow. I shall be sent for in private to him. Uh, look you, he must say him thus to the world. This that you heard was but color. <laughs> A color that I fear you will die in, Sir John. Fear me no callous. <laughs> Go. Major. Barber. Sir. Perger. Lieutenant. Pistol. <laughs> Bardolf. <laughs> I, I shall be sent for soon. At supper time. Go, carry Sir John Polestar to the fleet. Take all his company along with you. No, you I like this fair proceeding of the king's. He hath intent his wounded followers shall all be very well provided for. But all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. The king hath called his parliament, my lord. I will lay odds that ere this year expire, we bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. I heard a bird so sing, whose music, to my thinking, pleased the king. Come, will you hence? Beseech you, if you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, our humble author will continue the story with Sir John in it and make you merry with fair Catherine of France. Where, for anything I know, Falstaff shall die of a sweat, unless already he be killed with your hard opinions. My tongue is weary. When my legs are too, I will bid you good night, and so kneel down before you, but indeed. <laughs>